So I have five points to share to make evangelization, street evangelization, really easy. Do I have five minutes before that to kind of frame that in Jesus? Absolutely, yes. Please take your time. So let's look at Jesus with the woman at the well. That's John chapter 4. Jesus is walking through a place that's north of Jerusalem, uh, and it's obviously very hot. And it says he's fatigued. It's interesting. The Latin uses the word fatigue. So even the Son of God is tired. The apostles go off to get some food. They're going to go buy some food. And this woman that he meets at the well as he stops to take a break has had six husbands. Many people think she's there at noon. It says a six hour at noon because she's ashamed of her past. And it's not just that she had marital struggles, struggles like some Bible studies say. She's living in sin. The sixth person that she's with right there is in sin. And yet Jesus sits down, asks her for water, and the Son of God takes water from a woman living in sin. It's absolutely astonishing. But if you look at it, he starts to talk to her about the normal things of life before he gets down to religion. And, you know, the funny thing is by the time they're done, they're talking about the three things that polite people don't talk about in conversa- conversation, sex, politics, and religion. Right. right. And Fulton Sheen makes the point that the one thing that was more embarrassing than her talking about Samaritan religion is talking about her six husbands. So she brings the topic back to religion. And she says, we worship on this mountain. That's Mount Gerizim, north of Jerusalem. We worship on this mountain, but you say you should only worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus starts to talk about how you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. But he has almost a veiled mystical Um, explanation of the worship that's going to be coming, which is Christian worship. God is seeking those who would worship in spirit and truth, and it's not going to be located on any single mountain. Well, uh, she goes back to this town, assumedly as a little bit of an outcast, and she tells about this man that she now thinks is the Messiah. And now why would they believe someone with six husbands? They see she's changed. Mm -hmm. And then the whole town wants Jesus to stay, and it's interesting. How do they then know he's the savior of the world? If you look at the Latin, St. John writes, Audivimus, we've heard him. It's not just what he, it's not just what she had said. They come and listen to him and they can hear in him, this must be the Messiah. And they call him the savior of the world. I don't even know anywhere else in the gospel where you see that. The Greek is, is soter to cosmo. Soter is where we get the word soteriology, the study of salvation. Cosmo is where we get cosmos. So here you have an outcast woman, just one woman, Go say, I've met the Messiah. They hear him talk, and then they call him the Soter Soter to Cosmo, the Savior of the world. What's amazing is not only are they not even baptized Christians, they're not even Jews at this point. And so one person he talks to, a woman living in sin with five husbands, becomes this uh, apostle to an entire town that calls him Savior of the world in Latin, Sabbatra Mundi. It's the only time I know in the Gospels that say this. So... Um, for your listeners, you can extricate out of that five easy things to evangelization. So this is five things I'm going to give you to make this really easy. Because some people look at like the video I put up yesterday. One one of my friends said, well, he has a grace to do that. Everything we do is by God's grace, of course. But I really think if you extract this idea of evangelization out of it, um, at least the initial steps become easy. So here's my five steps. Polus, P-O-L-U-S, that is Latin for pole, P-O-L-U-S. These are the five steps to remember. I can only remember things in mnemonics, so maybe your listeners can do that too. Uh, P is pray. Pray as soon as someone comes up to you. You know, a lot of times in discussions on religion, especially with everything happening in the world, we don't bring up the topics of religion. Someone will come up to you and say, hey, I hear you're against divorce, or I hear you think this, or I hear you're a Trump voter, or I hear you're against contraception. Most of evangelization happens the other direction. It's usually pagans trying to change our mind. So as soon as you see one of those relationships or those conversations starting, just say a quick prayer because God knows this person's entire past, present, and future. And now I'm not saying pray so that you can have what charismatics call a word of knowledge into that person's life. There are many charismatics who I believe that's a real gift, so I'm not ripping on them. But if you prophesy in someone's life and it's wrong, you look like a buffoon. And, you know, the Old Testament, it's, it's death, actually, if you misprophesy. So what the reason I say that God knows their past, present, and future is just make this prayer. God, let only your will be done in this conversation. Really simple. God, please let your will be done in this conversation. Uh, just a real quick prayer. So that's P, prayer. Can I share oh, one thing that I do, Father? Yeah. When these things are happening, what I like to do is I make a silent prayer and I invoke my confirmation graces. 
Great. Because so often we Catholics are like, oh, I got confirmed. I graduated from Catholic ed or whatever it is. But confirmation is the sacrament that equips you to do the things that Father's talking about. To go to jail, to be martyred, to witness, to teach someone about Jesus. So, you know, we don't, we don't want to just get confirmed and set that over on the side. We talk about our baptismal graces, but let's talk about our confirmation graces. That's right. I went to confession to a Novus Ordo priest about three weeks ago, and he said, how often do you call on your ordination graces? And I was like, never in 10 years. I've never done it. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it really convicted me. I have to call on my ordination graces. Never even thought about that. Mm. Okay, O is only one. Here's what I mean by that. If there's two of you and one other person, a lot of times, especially if you're fervent Catholics, people want to get into words sideways on apologetics. No, 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 no. If you realize it's a two-on-one, two Christians with one pagan, one of you should recuse himself from the conversation to go pray, kind of just turn away, stay in silence. This is not going to be an apologetics competition because two-on-one will inevitably scare that person off. So always make sure uh, that there's only one person talking. Now, if you're surrounded by a mob of pagans, like we saw in that video that you tried to show at the beginning, that's that's going to be different. You better huddle together, pray right. and stuff. But if it's a two on one, only have one person talk. Um, so that's O. So P-O. P-O-L. Uh, L is listen. Listen is really important. So let's say you're walking on the street and you meet some 17 year old kid who says that his stepdad kicked him out for drugs. There's some Catholics out there who would kind of moralize that and be like, well, what were you doing using drugs? Why were you using drugs? But if you say to that kid, that must really be hard for you to have come from a divorced family and be living on the streets, he will immediately trust you. Even secular psychologists say the very best way to be trusted is to repeat back what someone has told you. And in that, I mean, that might sound like a trick just to make easy converts. But it's not. People long for a human relationship. In a time of social media, very few people listen to anybody. So if you show that you listen to this kid, wow, that must be really hard that you haven't seen your family in a year and you're living on the streets. He'll immediately trust you because you understood something of his life. And this is why Jesus speaks first to that woman about the normal things of life before he gets to worship on Jerusalem versus worship in Mount Gerizim, all, all these advanced topics. She had to trust him at the human level first. And then uh, you is is understanding. Um, show that you understand what they are. I guess I kind of just covered that by repeating it back. Show that you understand um, something of their life. And then the last is is S C P O L U S. S is seed, and that's just plant a seed. And so if you saw in that video that I did at Dunkin' Donuts yesterday, I understood that giving her a Maclis medal, she's not about to accept Jesus as her savior and go get baptized in a Catholic church by the time I pulled over and did the rest of that video. But like you showed, who knows, maybe that miraculous medal, what St. Maximilian Colby called a bullet, that could have been the single bullet that brought you to be preaching the gospel to hundreds of thousands of people a day right now. And that's something very, very small. I used to think by the time, like if I were evangelizing someone on an airplane, well, I had to get them to accept Christ by the time this airplane landed. <laughs> and that's great. I, I mean, if you're in the unitive stage of prayer, that'll happen. St. Teresa of Avila would walk through Spain and people would see her. People who'd been to Mass their whole lives living in sin would see her face and convert. If you're in the unitive stage of prayer, great, you can do that. But for those of us who aren't in the unitive stage of prayer, sometimes giving a miraculous medal, maybe they'll come back to you and be like, hey, I met you that one time. Uh, I'd like to talk more to you. Then you can meet for coffee for two hours and then you can get into the deeper stuff. So I'm not saying at the superficial level, you just give a miraculous medal and move on. Hopefully this leads to a two hour coffee or a two hour beer or something sitting down with an open Bible to discuss these things. But you can't force anybody to do anything. So if you look at Polus, P-O-L-U-S, the funny thing is for my five steps of evangelization, only one of those was actually evangelization. S, plant the seed. Mm. Uh, it might be just as basic as saying to them, Jesus loves you so much, he died for you so that you could live forever with him in heaven. So even if you don't have a miraculous medal, even one line of the promise of eternal life that Christ offers us by his sacrifice on the cross, that one seed could be the hope that people are looking for that day. It's beautiful. And it's so simple. Polis. Polis. P-O-L-U-S. And like yeah. you said, like you said, you don't have to hit all five. Just do something. It's and it says in, in the New Testament, you know, some people plant the seed, mm -hmm. some some people water, and some people bring in the harvest. And right. you might be 
the guy who, who puts the seed in the ground. And you might put out a hundred seeds. Not That's every right. seed that goes in the dirt, we know, produces a crop. So we just do it. I, and I think back to that man who gave me a miraculous medal. That was how many years before that, before I became a Catholic? Uh, I don't know, many years, many, many years. Yeah. Not a decade, but a, but a long, many years. Sometimes it's St. Paul and it's just miraculous and there's a conversion. And sometimes it happens over time. And, you know, that guy, later on, I did find that guy who gave me the miraculous medal when I was a Catholic. He said, I'm a Catholic now. He was did pumped. you? He was pumped. By your baptism grace and your conf and your confirmation grace, um, you have what w what every person on the planet's heart was made for, which is Christ and his church. And you don't have to make them convert right then and there, but we're all called to plant these seeds. And if you can, get a bunch of chains and miraculous medals, have them blessed uh, to hand out. Let Mary do the heavy lifting on these. But if all you can remember is just to simply say, Jesus loves you enough to die for you because he wants to live forever with you, um, that will be a seed planted that could change someone's life forever.